Well, hello, folks. My name is Kevin Darty. I'm with the Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom program. And this month, we're doing our PD and your PJs just a little differently. We want you to be ready for January. And what we're preparing for you is to showcase what we're launching for January. So grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea, sit back and enjoy our presentation as we showcase what the Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom program is doing for you in the month of January. We would like to mention this is being sponsored by our friends and our partners at the Midwest Dairy Association. So uh, with your coffee or your tea, make sure you add a splash of milk or cream to that too. Chris, we'll go ahead to the next slide. For January, our theme is dairy. Um, although June is dairy month, we all hope to be out of school by the, by the time June rolls around. So we're talking about dairy because January 11th is National Milk Day. And that's one of those fictitious made up holidays that goes along with the day that maybe, kind of, sort of, we think milk was first delivered to homes at that time. So we're gonna celebrate dairy this month. And we've got a sub theme as, of fibers. Um, because now more than ever with it being cold outside, you know you need some fiber. So we're going to talk about not only the food that we enjoy from agriculture, but also the fiber as well. Chris is going to go over January's lessons and activity schedule with you. So if you guys have been following along with us throughout this uh, academic year, we're going to continue to do uh, a lesson release on Thursday mornings. Our intention with that is that you get it on Thursday and that would give you some time to possibly be able to use that lesson the following week. Uh, in addition to our four weekly lessons uh, here in January, we're going to continue with our classroom challenges, our family cooking challenges, and then also our family engagement challenges. So we'll talk a little bit more about those in, in more detail, but we'll continue to re release those based on this schedule. And then we're really excited too, we're going to um, have a, a live uh, PD in your PJs for the month of February. Our focus is going to be on Lincoln. We'll talk more about that later. And that's going to be on January uh, 23rd, that Saturday morning, we'll be hosting that once again. So we'll go back to the way we previously previously done these PD and your PJs uh, there in January. So we'll go ahead and talk a little bit here about uh, both our field trip as well as our, uh, our challenges. So our field trip uh, in, uh, in the month of January is going to be on January 14th, and we're going to the Lincaitis Holstein's Dairy Farm. We're partnering with Midwest Dairy to do this, and we're very excited about this one. We're going to do something that we haven't done before. We're actually going to record this live and stream it live from the dairy farm. And so you're going to actually see uh, a day in the life of a dairy farmer. And so it's going to be really cool, um, and we'll, it'll be a little bit different experience than our, than our other uh, field trip uh, visits have been with our pre-recorded videos. The only catch with that is if you've already signed up for our field trip invites and been getting those emails, this one's a little bit different because we are partnering with Midwest Dairy. And so if you use this link right here, uh, the iaitc.co slash dairy trip, that will take you to a Zoom webinar sign up and you'll sign up for that through Midwest Dairy and get the links for that. Um, we'll be hosting that on a Zoom webinar and you'll also be able, if your students are learning remotely at that time, uh, you'll be able to stream that individually through YouTube Live. And so they'll have a couple different ways to, uh, to watch that. And then as always, we'll record that so that you can watch that at a later time with your students as well. That's coming up January 14th, Lenkaitis Dairy Farm. Very excited about that. We've also got some challenges uh, this month and, and all of these are good challenges and things that students could do at home, but there are also some good lessons that you could potentially do uh, in, in your classroom possibly as well. And so we're gonna kind of talk a little bit about um, both the family cooking challenge and the family engagement challenge. Before I go on to those, I'll, I'll touch on our classroom challenge here. So we focused a lot this year on our, on our uh, social media and Kevin just brought up National Milk Day here in January. So our challenge for classrooms is to design your own national day. So think of an important day that we should be singling out, we should be celebrating and come up with a reason why we need that as a new national day. So that's our, our classroom challenge for January. Let's talk a little bit about our family engagement challenge. Uh, for that, we're challenging families to make your own milk plastic. And I have a video, I think I'm gonna try it and see if it works on here. If not, I may have to switch my screen. So earlier in the year, I made milk plastic for the first time and I decided to film the process with my son. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you this video uh, so that you're able to kind of see what that looks like. This is a great activity for home, but also could be a really exciting uh, learning opportunity in the classroom as well. So here's our, our guide to making milk plastic. Hey everybody, we're here today to show you how to make 
plastic out of milk. Now we have never done this before, but we're gonna take you along for the ride and let's see how we do. So we just need a couple basic ingredients. We have a cup of milk, we have four tablespoons of white vinegar, and we're gonna start by heating those up together and making curds and whey. All right, this could be really cool. It's gonna look like so cool. All right, so we have our milk warming up here. We're gonna take our vinegar and we're going to pour that in there. And then we're gonna just gently stir. Now watch it, see look, it's instantly separating out. Doesn't look like milk anymore, does it? Nope, this looks like egg beer. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna stir this gently for about a minute and fully separate the curds and the whey. So we've separated out our curds and our whey and now we're going to strain out the whey so we're left with just the curd. This is gonna look a little exciting, I bet. Stuff looks kind of gross now. Real gross. Okay, so we have our curds here, and our goal is to, we're gonna try to make some little toys using these cookie cutters. Uh, I've also seen they make those silicon molds for like ice cube trays um, with, on all different shapes and sizes. I've seen people do it with those. We don't have those, so we're gonna try it here today with our cookie cutters. Yep. Before we're ready to do that, Lincoln, we are gonna have to squeeze more liquid out of these curds. So. Yep, I don't know what he's doing. Okay, so we're gonna get these on here. Okay, and why don't you roll this up and just squeeze it to try to get the water out of them. You wanna try it? Yeah, press on it and squeeze it. That's a little hot. Is it warm still? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we might need to do this a couple times to get as much liquid out of here as we can. Okay, so we have our milk plastic right here nice and pliable. So you're going to choose the train yeah. or the star? The train? Okay, so lay that down on there. Okay, so now you're going to push that into all the corners and spread that out in a nice even layer. This feels a little weird. Yeah. It feels like solid milk or something. Mm-hmm, kind of looks like that too, doesn't it? Yeah. It feels like something. As we are pushing our plastic into our cookie cutter mold. I thought I'd give you a little bit of background here. So we don't show it in the video, but uh, we actually had to do a couple different tries to get to a plastic that was actually pliable and was gonna work for us. So we ended up reducing down to, we did one cup of milk to four teaspoons of vinegar. And as long as we stirred slowly and it stayed in one big clump, that made a really good plastic that was pliable that we could easily push into the mold. I wanted to also tell you a little bit about the science behind this because that's really what makes this a cool activity is talking about all these different scientific processes that go into place here. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a polymer. So a polymer uh, are molecules that have formed a regular chain structure. So milk contains casein proteins, that's C-A-S-E-I-N, casein proteins that are all folded up inside of the milk. The reaction between the warm milk and the acid and the vinegar causes the casein to unfold and form these long chains, which are called a polymer. So essentially what we've made here is acid casein, which is basically an organic plastic, as opposed to the synthetic plastics that we're used to seeing. Acid casein used to be used as a plastic, particularly it was used to make buttons uh, because it's hard, it's strong, and it's insoluble in water. So it was a, a way to make plastic before we knew anything about synthetic plastics. Our milk plastic isn't completely dry yet, but I did want to show you what it looks like. So clearly, you don't even have to squint that hard. It looks like a train. Uh, it's, it's not totally dry. It's still a little bit squishy, but I can feel around the edges that it's getting rock hard, and so it's, it's well on its way. From what I understand, it takes about two days to fully dry. I didn't want to wait that long, so I actually put mine in a food dehydrator for about six to eight hours, and I think probably in another, another four to six hours, I think it'll be totally hard. Now, once it hardens all the way, you can paint this with acrylic paints. That works out just fine. Uh, you could drill a hole through it to uh, make it into an ornament. If you had smaller uh, shapes of things, you could make them into pendants or necklaces or all sorts of different applications that you could use to make crafts in your classroom. I've also read that you can actually, before you dry it, you can actually soak it 
in vinegar with some food coloring and that coloring will actually penetrate the plastic and color the plastic that way as well. So lots of different ways that you could experiment with this in your class. To turn this into an experiment, there's lots of things that we could do. We could test different types of, of milk, 2% uh, skim, whole milk. You could test different uh, solutions of vinegar uh, using less or more vinegar. You could try uh, other liquids that and to see what happens. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can get students thinking about these, these chemical processes and engaging with it in an inquiry-based way. So I hope you found that interesting. Hopefully it's something that you want to try in your own classroom. I'm going to get this back into the dehydrator. All right, so a lot of ways, again, that could be a great classroom experiment. Um, oops. Uh, but it's something we're challenging families to try to do at home. Uh, I, I would advise it does take a little time to, uh, to do it, um, to kind of experiment to make sure you get the right format for it. But once you've kind of figured that out, it's a pretty simple process and was, was pretty cool actually. So, so that is our making milk plastic activity, our family engagement challenge. Uh, our family cooking challenge is to make ice cream. And so one recipe that we've uh, been using for years is making ice cream in a bag. And so normally we'd be promoting this as an activity to do in your classroom. That's a little bit harder right now with social distancing with all those kind of things. And so um, we decided to make this our, our cooking challenge at home for, for this activity um, so the kids could still get the experience of making ice cream. Again, this is a really easy way to make ice cream. Families don't need to buy any, any new materials or anything like that. They just need some basic ingredients. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool way to, to kind of physically make the ice cream yourself in a bag here. So I'll show you this quick video about how I made uh, ice cream in a bag uh, earlier this summer. It's a bright sunny afternoon on a Friday in summer. I'm wearing my party shirt. What better time could there possibly be than now to make homemade ice cream in a bag? I'll tell you, the only better time would be in your classroom with your students. So to do this, we need a few basic things. We need some ice, some heavy whipping cream, some salt, a little vanilla extract, some sugar, some milk, some tape, and a couple of Ziploc bags. And that's all we need to make homemade ice cream in a bag with our students. Let's get started. All right, we're ready to go. So I take my first Ziploc bag. I have one cup of milk and one cup of heavy whipping cream that I've placed in my measuring cup. I'm gonna pour that into my bag. I'm gonna add a quarter cup of sugar, half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, let air out of that bag, I'm gonna seal it up. Now, this is important for me, um, but more important when you're doing this in your classroom, you're probably gonna to wanna to have a little bit of an insurance policy here and tape this bag up uh, just to be sure that doesn't come undone in there. I'm embarrassed to say I could not find any duct tape, so I'm using painter's tape. I imagine duct tape would probably be a little bit better for this, but we're gonna use what we got here. Okay, got our bag sealed up. Now, I'm gonna place that bag inside another Ziploc bag, and then I'm gonna pour in my ice. I kinda chopped up some of this ice ahead of time. If you just buy a bag of ice at the store, that would probably be chunked up enough that it'll work just fine. All right. Now, in order to freeze, this ice cream needs to get colder than the freezing point of ice. So we're gonna add salt to help with that. Now, I'm just using a coarse uh, kosher salt. Rock salt would actually work better, and it's also cheaper. Again, I just didn't have it at home, so I'm using what I have. All right, now we're gonna shake this for what will probably be the longest 10 minutes of my life. So I'm gonna use a dish towel because this is gonna start getting really cold really fast. So I'm gonna protect my hands and here we go. It's like arm day at the gym, but I don't even go to the gym.
All right, let's see how we did here. So I'm gonna remove the inner bag. I'm gonna kinda wipe that off because there's it's salty water. I don't want that to get on the ice cream. Okay. So you can see, very much ice cream consistency after 10 minutes. Oh yeah, nothing wrong with that. All right, so in conclusion, a couple thoughts for your classroom. One, this kitchen towel was nowhere near thick enough. The cold came right through that, so some kind of bath towel or something that's thicker is gonna be better for your students to use. Also, think about, this is, takes 10 minutes to make, but this makes way more ice cream than one student needs, and so you could have small groups of students who take turns to shake the ice cream, and then that cuts down on their, you know, losing interest in doing that, but also makes it more of a group effort, and then you don't have gallons and gallons of ice cream floating around. Other thing you could think about is all the different science implications. You know, we have the reaction with the, with the cold ice. What reaction does the salt have when it's added to that ice? Why does, the, why does this turn into ice cream? So there's all sorts of, of science-related things that we can do with this, in addition to just celebrating eating a dairy product, eating some ice cream in our classroom. So lots of ways that we can try to incorporate that in there. All right, enjoy. All right, so again, in simpler times, that would be a, a great activity to do uh, in, uh, in your classroom. But uh, for now, we're recommending that for families uh, to do at home. Again, be a great family activity, get the whole family involved. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie and she's gonna start, start talking about some of our weekly lessons. Okay, good morning. Um, so our very first lesson that we're gonna be putting out um, in January is gonna be Moo Mask. So that's the, gonna be for the first week of, of January. Um, Moo Mask is such a fun activity for some of our younger kiddos especially. Um, at the bottom uh, hand of the corner, you can see what, it, what the Moo Mask is. Basically, you're just using paper plates uh, markers, some scissors to cut out the whole staples to staple the plates and, and the ears together. Um, and then we additionally have an ear tag that goes along with this. Um, this activity is really great uh, when you have students who are learning um, basic addition and pulling in that math curriculum into there um, because the tag on their ear, um, one way that you can get the number is by having them count up the number of letters in their first name adding it to the number of letters in their uh, last name, and then that would be the total number. So for example, if your name was Jonathan Deer, Jonathan has nine letters and Deer has four. So you would have a nine, a four, and then nine plus four is 13. So your tag number would then be 9413. So all of your students' tag numbers will be um, unique to their own personal names. Um, and then a great thing to do is have them uh, practice some sequencing, have your students line up in numerical order and see you know, how quickly they can do it. You can make it a fun competition. Um, we also love the, the book Clarabelle by Chris Peterson. Um, so many facts about, about cows and dairy and, and the breeds. And so that's a really fun thing, um, a fun way to tie in literature with this uh, sort of activity. Um, another great extension for this activity would then be to have students uh, talk about what does a cow look like? What are the, the physical features of a cow? And we have a great um, activity called the beautiful bovine and they could pair the moo mass that they've just made to um, this activity. So we have a, a video that kind of describes um, what this activity is about. Today we're going to learn how a cow is different than a human. First, cows have really big ears compared to humans. Cows have tails, which is good because they don't have hands, but if they have tails, they can swap flies off. A female cow has an eye, which she uses to make milk. 
has our roommates, which means they have four parts to their stomach. Cows have rough tongues so they can eat. Humans have skin, but cows have hides. Cows don't have hands, but they have four hoofs. So that's just a fun activity for students to start recognizing the features of a cow, uh, doing some comparing and contrasting between humans and cows and, and um, the unique looks. Um, this would be a really fun activity to have your students choose their favorite breed of cow and then they can decorate, you know, their moo mask based on their, their favorite breed. So that's our moo mask activity. And that information and more can be found in our Dairy Ag Mag. So uh, if you're looking for more breed specific or you want to do something like that, that's great. Another activity we've done with the, um, with the ear tags is to, uh, um, you could also have students use the, their, their date of birth. Uh, with uh, all this virtual learning, sometimes passwords asking for your date of birth. Uh, my birthday is March 23, so I'd be 0323. So which one comes first, 0323 or uh, my wife, who is 1226, 1226, and you can still line up like that way. So um, that, that, whole idea of, um, that whole idea of ear tags is to provide identification. We do that by names. Cattle are numbered uh, so the farmer can take care of them and see where they're at. Um, for, for our third week, for our third week, as we head into, um, as we head into uh, the third week of January, we're going to be starting to think about um, uh, fiber. And, uh, you know, you think of that average, uh, you think of that average uh, fourth grader or third grader, your student, what they're wearing during the month of January, probably a, a t-shirt and hoodie and a pair of jeans and a pair of socks, all sorts of cotton. And how much cotton do they use? We've got a great activity that we talk about, about king cotton. And how much cotton do they have? Even for our at-home learners, this would be a great activity. Literally, weigh your clothes. Have them put a spare set of clothes, put them on the scale and see how much that weighs. I know I sometimes cheat when I jump on the scale and try and figure out how much, how much weight I should take off for my clothes. But there's a lot of cotton involved. Even in just that, that outfit that I discussed, uh, blue jeans and, and a t-shirt and a pair of socks and a uh, um, uh, sweatshirt. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of cotton there. Take off an ounce or two for the zippers and the, and the plastic that's involved in it. You're still using a lot of cotton and that cotton is grown as a fiber. So our activity on King Cotton, you'll enjoy that. Not only does it talk about uh, cotton, we also have the historic application of uh, we have a historic application of using cotton and the cotton gin and the history behind that. One thing a lot of people see is uh, they, they, they talk about cotton and it's a fiber, but a number of people haven't actually seen cotton. So uh, your ag literacy coordinator, a number of them have cotton bowls that they can help you get or show or sample of. And um, uh, we'll provide in the link, uh, the, the email link that day to order your own. There's a great research uh, resource. Uh, his name is The Cotton Man, thecottonman.com. He's a wonderful guy. He's got a great website and you can get educational seconds. So he goes out and instead of harvesting this cotton like with a commercial harvester that would be used for clothing and fabric, he plants the carton and the cotton and uses it for ornamental decorations. So you guys think of Chip and Joanna or the fine folks at hometown and they're decorating with cotton. That's the kind of thing he, he, he does this for. You see these things at Hobby Lobby, but he can provide for you at, at relatively low cost, actual cotton bowls where you actually get the plant itself and the students can, can participate in finding out this is a flower and inside that flower, there are seeds. So you can actually start hand ginning the cotton and finding the seeds. After you separated your pile of lint and your pile of seeds, Figure out how much that, that lint weighs. Uh, cotton doesn't weigh a whole lot. How many, how many bowls of cotton, how much cotton do you need for all of the material you have? Um, I'm broadcasting live today from our house and it's a big old house and it was built back in the 1800s and we have really small closets. That's because back in the day, you didn't have as many clothes as we do now. You didn't have as many towels and extra sets of sheets. You had only what you needed. So think of that and how much cotton we use and it's all hand grown. 
to pair with that, we're also going to talk a little bit of uh, uh, you're, you're celebrating Martin Luther King Day, celebrating some of those things as we head into February of Black History Month. But there's a phenomenal book by Peggy Thomas, by Peggy Thomas, George Washington Carver for Kids. And his work, not only with, uh, he did do some work with cotton, but also soybeans and peanuts as well. There are several great books uh, with with Carver. We love Peggy Thomas's George Washington Carver for Kids. There's another great book by Susan Grigby, Grigsby, a Missouri author called uh, In the Garden with Dr. Carver. This is a great book. And let's not forget our, let's not forget our graphic novels and folks that uh, want to want to take on that challenge. We've got a great book by Nathan Olson called George Washington Carver, The Ingen Ingenious Inventor. So that's our King Cotton activity as we head toward fiber. Okay, our next activity. No, <laughs> oh, yeah, milk emulsion. That's our next activity. So, um, this is a really uh, cool activity that you can turn into a scientific inquiry, um, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But um, one book that we really love uh, that pairs very well with this activity is Tales of the Dairy Godmother by Viola Butler, um, and we actually had. Uh, this awesome uh, ability to be able to um, have the book read aloud. And that's actually, you can find that on both our blog and our YouTube channel. So if you want to show the actual reading of the story, um, you can find it there. Um, so we're gonna show you a video of, of the milk emulsion experiment, and then um, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay. All right, so this is whole milk. So this is the milk that you drink, all right? And so whole milk has more fat in it than like skim milk, the, the milk that Ami drinks. So milk is what's called an emulsion, which means it's fat particles that are suspended in water. So I'm gonna prove that to you. So you've got some food coloring. So I want you to put a couple drops of food coloring just in the middle, just drop a couple drops, okay? Just like, just like uh -huh. boop, boop, yep, exactly. It's right in the middle there. That's good, plus plenty, yep, okay? And then let's do some red, like, kind of like over here. Okay, same thing, just real gentle. Oops, don't swirl it around. Here, there might be a thing on it still, let's see. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my production assistants need to take care of this ahead of time. Okay. Couple drops. Just like one. Like right next to it, just like two drops. Oh, just do a couple more right in the middle. Oh, that'll, that'll do, yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's let that settle. We need to try to not move the table. What's that? Huh, that? No, that's not food coloring, what is that? It's Dawn dish soap. Oh yeah, Dawn dish soap. Okay, so try not to move the table. Try not to move the table. We need to stand here so it doesn't rock the table. So what happens when we use soap? When we're washing dishes. And it gets clean? Yeah, it, it takes everything off, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if we take some soap, put it on the end of here. Okay, well, all I want you to do is just put that and just gently push it down into the milk and just leave it there, right? And put it right in the food coloring. Oh. Isn't that cool? Sure. Okay, you can try it again. Put it, Pop it down somewhere else. Look at it, it's still swirling around. You need to get a, little, get a little more on the other side of it. Here, get some soap over here. Okay, try it again. Okay, so you know why it does that? Why? Because, do it where the coloring is. You might have to swirl it a little bit. So it does that because that soap is disrupting the fat in the milk and it's pushing the fat all over the place. So it's, it's messing up the emulsion and that's why it spins those colors everywhere. Okay, I'm um, okay. Okay, sounds good. All right, cool. Thank you. So that's a really um, fun activity for students who are even in junior high, high school um, level. You can always learn something from that and it's just kind of fun to watch. Um, and so like Chris said in the video, um, it's an emulsion. So we have um, proteins and fats that are um, hanging out in water and that's what milk is. And when you put the soap down in there, it's gonna react, it's disrupting 
the, um, that calmness of the, the fat and, and protein molecules in the milk. And so when those are disrupted, they get pushed. And when they get pushed and shoved in, into one another, they start um, folding and bending and reacting in that way. And so the, the food coloring is what is allowing us to see that movement. It's allowing us to see the reaction from the soap to those um, fat and protein molecules. Um, so you can use whatever colors of um, food coloring that you want to. And you could turn this into a scientific inquiry lesson. So just like um, in the um, previous experiments with the uh, milk plastic, trying out different types of milk. Um, obviously whole milk has more fat molecules in there. So what would, what would the soap um, look like if it reacted to uh, skim milk or um, whipping cream um, or 2%? So you could definitely try that out. You could try out different brands of milk. You have whole milk for one brand versus is whole milk of a different brand. Does that make a difference? Do those milks come from the same, um, you know, factory? Um, what about the different types of soap that you're using? Is Dawn dish soap the best? Does it compare to a different type of soap? Um, so you could definitely test out all of those differences. Um, and the cool thing is that, that the food coloring is what shows us that there is an actual reaction happening. So um, that's a really fun one that you can do in your classroom um, or at home. All right, our final lesson for the month goes back to uh, our fiber theme. And so this is sweater weather weaving. So we pair this with uh, the book, Charlie Needs a Cloak. And uh, the version that we're gonna share with you at the end of January, we have a, a really simple braid that um, basically you buy yarn, cut lengths of yarn, and then have students weave that together to make essentially like a friendship bracelet, or they could make like a, a little woven bookmark or something like that. Um, we've done a really simple braid. There are lots of other more complicated braids out there. So if you have older students, I want to challenge them to, to find a, a more difficult braid to do. There's lots of ways that you could make this a little bit more challenging. Um, but a really good way to, to get students to thinking, think more about where does our fiber actually come from, right? And so whether you're using wool yarn or, or cotton yarn, talking about um, the plants and the animals that, uh, that have allowed us to have those materials and allow us to, to you know, have clothing and have, uh, you know, bedding and you know curtains and all those kinds of things that we use all these different fibers for and so that's our sweater weather weaving lesson again uh, intended for younger grades but could easily be made uh, more challenging and, and brought up to a, to an upper elementary level as well so that's our final lesson for the month and so I'll turn it over to Kevin to preview uh, what uh, February looks like Um, so February, we're really excited about February. And before we, before we head to February, this is important. If you're listening now, this is important. Our friends at the Midwest Dairy Association are sponsoring a gift for you if you've watched this far. On the job form that Chris included with the, uh, with the actual uh, uh, material, there's going to be a space for a code word. That's how you win your prize. Your code word is ice cream. Ice cream is the code word. So you want the goodie bag, you're in charge of putting that code word. The code word is ice cream. It goes in the job form to get your certificate. That's how you're gonna win that. But as we look forward to February, we're really excited. We're gonna be talking about Lincoln. I've got, uh, we got President's Day coming back. I got George and Lincoln, Dave uh, joining me in the background there. Our theme will be Lincoln. <clears throat> we will have a couple of really exciting act opportunities. First off, our, uh, virtual farm tour will be to the Mount Pulaski Courthouse. The Mount Pulaski Courthouse is uh, in Logan County, Illinois, just north of Springfield. That At one point in time, Mount Pulaski was the county seat of Logan County before it moved to Lincoln. And this courthouse is now a foundation. It's a historic site. And Abe Lincoln actually walked on these planks. It was a courthouse where he practiced and it still exists. And we're gonna join there. We're gonna talk a little local history and agriculture with our friends at the Mount Pulaski Courthouse in Mount Pulaski, Illinois. Our author interview, we will be bringing back our author interview in February, will be with Peggy Thomas. Peggy Thomas has written a book called Lincoln Clears a Path. You might have heard that name before. She wrote the, the George Washington Carver book, but she also has written books on George Washington called George Washington uh, Plants a Nation, Farmer George Plants a Nation, 
Thomas Jefferson grows a nation, and this is the third in her trilogy of presidents and how presidents and elected officials actually helped agriculture and helped the development of agriculture across the, uh, across the, uh, uh, the nation as we grew as a nation. Our sub theme will be transportation. Uh, Lincoln actually developed, holds a patent. Abe Lincoln holds a patent and it's a, uh, it's a transportation device that actually helps lift boats over the shoals in shallow water of rivers. So it talks about Lincoln and not only, he wasn't necessarily a farmer, he, he was reluctant with farming, but he did travel and transport agricultural goods uh, from the Sangam to the uh, Illinois and Mississippi and down the port of New Orleans on the on the uh, on river boats. So his his invention helped lift the boats over the shoals. We'll also be celebrating Black History Month with some book recommendations throughout the year, and you'll see some um, you'll see some of our challenges. Uh, the tinfoil flat boat. Uh, we're going to do uh, polishing a penny, so we've got some Lincoln things, and we found a really unique recipe: Mary Todd Lincoln's almond cake. It was a theory. It was supposedly Abe Lincoln's favorite dessert, and you're going to be able to make it. It's relatively simple to make. We've got some really cool lessons coming up uh, about that. So we're very excited about February, and we hope that you'll be able to join us on January 23rd. January 23rd, we'll release all of this in our next PD in your PJs coming up on January 23rd. Our friends at the Illinois Department of Agriculture, they're going to be sponsoring that one, and they will be our sponsors presenting our PD and your PJs on February with Lincoln and transportation as the theme. So with that, we encourage you to uh, check out the uh, blog site for more resources. Follow us at beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com. Make sure that you're maintaining good connection with your local county ag literacy coordinator. Uh, if you don't know who that is, you haven't reached out to those folks yet, follow us at aginetheclassroom.org. The second tab down on the, uh, the second tab down on the screen there, it'll say contact your county and you can be connected with someone in your county that can help provide these and other resources for you. You never know what's going to happen. So follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, because who knows when we might have some extra stuff to throw your way. With that, on behalf of Chris and Stephanie, I, I wish you Merry Christmas and don't forget to fill out your reflections. We'll keep this posted so you'll be ready to go. Try and fill this all out before the before you leave for Christmas break. Take, take, take the hour, fill it out before Christmas break. That way you can enjoy the holiday season and come back recharged and ready to go after the first of the year. So fill out that, that reflection, use your code word, you need to know what the code word is. Use your code word to get some fine uh, gifts from our friends at the uh, Midwest Dairy Association. And with that, on behalf of Chris and Stephanie, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we'll see you next year.